The meeting is now being streamed to YouTube. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to this select band of members and officers for this Finance Audit and Risk Committee. Please note the meeting is being streamed live across the world on the Council's YouTube channel. Uh, before the meeting starts, I would like to invite the committee member and scrutiny officer to confirm that the officers joining remotely can hear and be heard. And can I also welcome James to this, his first meeting. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Um, I believe we're only joined by two officers this evening, so I'll just run through them quickly if they can confirm that they can hear what I'm saying. So, Mark Chalkley. Yep, I can hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Great. And Ian Cooper. Yes, I can hear you. Thank you. Great. Thanks, James. Um, we have apologies for absence from councillors Sean Prendergast and councillor Adam Ruggiero Chaka, um, and the latter is being subbed. So welcome to councillor Nigel Mason. Also at this point, welcome councillor Ian Albert as the uh, exec member for finance. Uh, minutes from the 12th of July, 2021, I'd like to propose that we take as read and approve as a true record, the minutes of the meeting of the committee meeting held on the 12th of July. May I have a seconder, please? Okay, second. Uh, can we vote on that, please? Uh, do we have everybody's votes? Okay, thanks very much. I'm, I'm not sure there's going to be any knife edge votes tonight, Nigel, anyway, so <laughs> I don't think that's a problem. Right, so we're on to uh, notification of any other business. There is none. Um, right, my standard announcements in accordance with council policy, this meeting is being audio recorded as well as filmed. The audio recordings will be available to view on ModGov and the film recording via the NHDC YouTube channel. Declarations of interest. Members are reminded to make declarations of interest before an item. The detailed reminder about this and speaking rights is set out under Chair's announcements on the agenda. Public participation. Well, I'm pleased to say tonight we do have a member of the public here to speak to us. It's Roger Lovegrove from Transition Town Letchworth, who's going to speak for five minutes on risk management. So welcome, Roger, and over to you. Oh, I'm on first, am I? <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, I was looking through uh, your uh, website and found that your com your committee has the word risk in it. And as I used to lecture on risk in uh, British aerospace and in industry, uh, this uh, raised my interest sufficiently to wonder uh, whether you're taking some of the more macroscopic risks seriously. Uh, also, does the council keep a risk register? Uh, is this uh, register available to the public? Uh, and all, are all your risks of a financial nature? Or do they include building and housing risks, legal risk, climate risks, public awareness risks? I don't know the answer to these questions, uh, but I just thought there are people wondering about these things. And all this made me brainstorm some of the possible risks that you perhaps ought to be thinking about that perhaps aren't. So while recognising that they're not necessarily the accountability of your council, there may, some of these risks may have a significant impact on your population. And perhaps you should work up an appreciation of their likelihood, and the probability of them happening, and the consequences if they do indeed happen albeit some of them are very unlikely. So uh, I've got a list of uh, eight brainstormed risks. I'll just tuck into those eight, shall I? Shall I just go through them? Yeah. Uh, there is a clean heating revolution just around the corner. Radical changes to the building regulations expected by 2025, and of course the demise of gas. Are you assessing and quantifying the risks of ignoring these factors, particularly in your SPDs? That's the first one. 
Housing delinquency is a lovely phrase, housing delinquency. I'm told if you have the money to spend on housing, you're likely to spend on new housing, not maintaining your existing housing stock. Eventually, this could mean the existing housing stock becoming uninhabitable, and there's a risk. Third one, North Hertfordshire has very little of its own electricity generation and a very little water capture and storage. These resources are coming under increasing pressure due to the demise of the internal combustion engine and the ever-changing climate. Are you putting enough pressure on those services to be sure that when some of the worst things happen, they'll be able to um, um, meet, your, meet the population's requirements? And I can tell you one thing, Affinity Water doesn't plan to increase any cap increase capture and storage in East Anglia until they're not even going to think about it until 2080. You know, there are things that these organisations can get by because of Acts of Parliament enabling them uh, to scrounge water off other water authorities and so forth. But if there's a general countrywide shortage of water, you know, there will be a severe water shortage. Electric, uh, fourth one, electric cars requiring substantially more charging points. Are you being proactive in the transformation of council house fronts to cater for um, charging points or reactive and just allowing people to apply uh, on an ad hoc basis? There's a potential for a project there uh, to try and coordinate this uh, changeover from petrol to electric cars in a proactive rather than a reactive way. The fifth one, air quality. Are Roger, you... just to say you've got a minute to go if you want to oh, have speed I? Oh, up. dear. Right. Okay. Oh, sorry. Well, I was going to mention air quality, artificial intelligence, climate change, public awareness, Facebook and WhatsApp are becoming more aware of council issues and could become much more active. The closing of the M25 Monday of this week and uh, Wednesday of this week uh, are illustrations of how the public are becoming more proactive in uh, reacting to things like uh, our problems in North Hertfordshire, like the bottlenecks at Welling on the railway viaduct and the A1M. This is not intended to be a complete list, but perhaps is enough to get you considering a more rigorous identification policy. Um, also, you cannot leave this meeting and solve all these problems, but perhaps you ought to take a view on them and encourage their potential and consider their potential impact on the district, i.e. apply some risk management techniques to these issues. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you, Roger. That's, uh, that was kind of you to speed speed up there towards the end. I think so many of those points that you raise uh, have great relevance to us, of course, and uh, some of them you've raised in the environmental panel, which I was at on Monday as well. I'm, I'm never quite sure whether this is the right forum for that i mean we're we're not a policy setting i don't think uh committee that that's the main council and cabinet but then then we we manage the risk on an adopted council okay. policy so it's to get them to adopt the policy am i i'm not sure if i'm right or not but i'm seeing one or two nods so so the council adopts the policy and then we oversee the the risk of that but any, uh, any members wish to speak to that or have any questions? Yes, Adam. We certainly do have a risk register, um, which I'm sure we can have shared if it's if there's nothing that's that's too sort of uh, um, sort of confidential. We can always redact anything that's confidential and get that sent to you. I, I can hear you sort of want want that over. We've, so we've got sure Ian Cooper on the line, so he may well be able to uh, um, speak. But to that. Um, no, I think. Uh, Actually, just echoing what was what was said there, I think housing stock, since Settle owned most of the houses or nearly all the houses in, in the area, it's, it's, it's less of a risk for us. I think actually picking up on a few things there, water capturing storage um, and air quality are certainly something that we should we should maybe sort of ask if we can see something in the risk uh, register for next year, because I haven't seen anything. Um, sorry, risk register, risk uh, forward plan. So that would be quite interesting. Just come, can I just come back on that? Uh, no. <laughs> In theory, no. <laughs> Let's see if there's any councillors who wish to say anything. Thank you. Oh, 
I, I mean, obviously, I'm not, not a former member of the committee, but I mean, if it would be sort of helpful, and Mr. Cooper may well. Um, uh, Mr. Cooper chairs our, our risk management group. I'm, I'm the the executive member with as the champion for risk management. Um, you'll actually, if you've got, you can look at our papers for this meeting. There's the corporate risk, risk register, which is being discussed actually later in this uh, in this meeting. Um, the you can also find our risk management strategy, which is on our on on the North Outs Council website. Um, more than happy if you want to, you know, if you either want to, you know, write to uh, write write to me or to uh, Mr. Cooper. We we'll happy to sort of take away those points. I think uh, Councillor Compton, you know, I think made some important points there. We have what we call corporate risks, which are uh, we're on our corporate risk register, which is there, and there's also a, a range of service level risks which sit just below that, and a number of those issues are being looked at. Being like like vehicle charging and so on as part of our overall climate change strategy and and so on. So, um, but more than happy to you know correspond with you in a bit more detail about that if that would be uh, helpful. But a number of the documents you mentioned, like the risk management strategy, the risk register, the corporate risk register, are public documents, and indeed the corporate risk register is on the agenda for this meeting. Uh, this evening and it's actually in the in the public papers so hopefully that's helpful but more than happy to pick up those points and more than happy if mr cooper wants to cover anything sort of technical because he chairs the risk management group that the council um, runs and obviously members of this committee and uh, some members of this committee i know council hoskins has been to risk management group recently and obviously all members of this committee are invited to the to the quarterly risk management group um, that uh, the meets with um, officers, uh, I say on a on a quarterly basis. Okay, thanks very much, um, Claire. That was everything you wanted to yeah. raise, wasn't it? I think. Okay, um, thank you very much indeed for that. And I hope now we can progress a dialogue uh, with the, the relevant people with you. Okay, uh, moving on. Uh, Item six is the Shared Internal Audit Service Report, and that's presented by Mark Chalkley, who will then segue into item seven, which is the progress report for 21-22. Mark, over to you. Thank you, Chair. Um, the first report, the SIAS annual report, um, this is just to know, and I'm not intending to walk through this in any great detail, um, need, uh, just to say that uh, the report itself outlines the achievements and performance of SIAS as a partnership um, over the year of 2021, so the year that finished on the 31st of March. Um, I'm sure you can all remember that the year 2021 was heavily affected by the pandemic, um, and, and that's reflected throughout the report. Um, the real key point to, to note from that, though, is that the overall partnership performance um, was relatively strong last year in that we met the uh, billable days target of 95%, we achieved 96%, um, and we achieved 94% on the project's target versus the, the target of 95%. Um, and I'd just like to point out at this point that last year, for the members who, who weren't part of this committee last year, um, North Arts achieved 99% on days and 100% on projects. Um, they're the re real kind of key takeaways from that report. Um, but I'm happy to, to try and answer any questions that members have on that one. Thanks, Mark. Uh, anybody want to speak to that? Or are we just happy to note? Yeah. Um, it does say we should vote on that. So can we vote to note then? duly noted thank you very much um and now to the progress report for 21 22 which is probably of more interest mark back to you thank you um so i'm just gonna i'm gonna go by paragraph numbers um please shout if you'd like me to to note the page number as well um so the first paragraph i'm looking at is paragraph 2.2 and the table there that shows the final reports that have been issued since the last committee um, 
strong assurance in in all the reports that have been issued. Um, and you'll know there's there's two reports from 2021 um, that were finalised just after the committee last time. So didn't quite make that cycle. Um, the next paragraph and the, um, the the kind of chunky part of this report is from 2.5 onwards, the proposed changes to the annual audit plan. Um, there have been a number of amendments that have been made to the audit plan as a result of the interim planning discussions that took place with senior managers during August. Um, when we set the plan in March, uh, we agreed that based off last year needing a lot of flexibility and agility within the plan, that we would plan for the first six months and then the second six months would be more flexible and we would meet with service directors and the managing director to ensure that the audit plan reflects council priorities, um, service objectives, the high level risks, any key projects that have been undertaken since the start of the year. So the changes within paragraphs 2.5 onwards um, is the outcome of those discussions um, to, to align the plan to the council objectives for the second half of the year. Um, the next paragraph that I'd like to draw your attention to is paragraph 2.11. Um, this table illustrates our performance against our indicators today. Um, and by way of an update, the billable days is now 114 days, uh, which represents 42% of the plan. And projects um, is we've now issued nine draft reports or, or final reports. Uh, that's 32%. So at this stage of the year, I'd say performance is on track. Um, all, all projects have been allocated uh, for the remainder of the year. Um, and it, it's now just the case of us delivering that work, which I'm confident will continue to happen as we move through the year. Um, and finally, Appendix B, um, I've updated this table to reflect the, the start quarters for the additional projects uh, based on the changes that I highlighted in paragraph 2.5 onwards. Um, happy to take any questions from members. Okay, thank you, uh, Mark. We're asked to um, note this progress report and note the plan amendments. Uh, any questions from members? Claire, did you? Yes, please. Um, the at um, two point six number C, the antisocial behaviour being removed. Um, do you have? The sort of numbers because it says that ASB reports have reduced. Do you have the numbers? Because that's not what I've been hearing locally. <laughs> um, I, I don't have the numbers to hand, no, unfortunately. Um, this was the result of a, a conversation with the service director responsible for, for ASB. Um, so I'm sure we can get hold of those numbers um, if that would be useful. Yes, please. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Compton, Adam. Thank you, Keith. Um, just a question regarding the leisure contracts. I can see it's been, I didn't realise it was a nine on the uh, risk and opportunities matrix last time round. I know it was due to start in quarter one, but it's, it's currently going through quality review, so it's not ready for this meeting, which I was expecting. Is it possible if we could have the audit report issued just for the next meeting so we could have a review that I assume it's got one day left and it's in quality reviews that so should be ready um, and also whether any concerns that have been picked up is is that why there might be a delay um, no I can confirm that that's been out in draft report and that's currently with um, officers to provide their response to that draft report so by the time the next committee comes around I'm fairly confident that should be finalised and will be shared with you um, I, in, in terms of the content of it, I don't have that to hand, but um, I'd, I'd like to wait for officers to provide their responses to anything in there um, in case um, what we've reported isn't factually accurate and we go through that draft process that um, we'll, we'll confirm all the accuracy before we share it, if that's okay. That's fair, Mark. So I'll probably uh, put you on the spot unfairly there. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe it's something that could be circulated once it's finished prior to the next meeting of this committee? Uh, all, all final reports are shared with um, all members of this committee. So yeah, you should, you should receive the final report when that's sent out. Lovely, thanks Mark. Okay, um, we're asked to note that progress report and note the 
planned amendments. So can we go to a vote on that, please, Mel? Thank you very much. It's, uh, That's motion's carried, Chip. Thank you. Um, right, I think we're now, and thanks, thanks, Mark, as well. Don't feel you've got to hang around for the rest of this uh, meeting. Um, we're now on to item eight, which is the risk management update. And Ian's around, Ian Cooper's around to present that, I think. Ian. Yes, thank you, Chair. I think you've got me for every single item from now onwards, so, so you're going to hear a lot of me. Um, in relation to the risk management point, I will start off with a quick response to what was discussed earlier after the public presentation. So it was my fault for not working out how to chip in uh, remotely at that point. Um, as I hope you members will be aware, we do have the um, risk um, matrix and also the detailed risk monitoring tool which is available to all members of this committee. Um, I'll send the links around to you again. Um, so you can access that via the internet and via Citrix. Um, we don't make it public, um, partly because there's so much information in there. There's lots and lots of risks. Um, and also, you know, at times we do want to put stuff in there that probably is confidential. So if we did get a request for certain information out of it, we would look at that and obviously make available whatever we can. And you will know from both this report and previous reports, uh, that we do publish the corporate risks when they come up. Um, so the, the, the full description that's held in that software, it is, is extracted from providers as part of the uh, part of it when it's just this meeting. So we are, we are as transparent as we can be, um, but we don't make it all publicly available. In terms of the report in front of you, um, uh, 2.1 summarizes pretty well what's happened in the last quarter. Uh, there are no actual recommendations for yourselves or for actually the cabinet in terms of changes to risk scores. Um, so it is really to note the report. Obviously, as always, there is some detail in there, but I'm happy to try and answer any questions that is that, on that content. Okay, thanks, uh, Ian. So there's really not a great deal of change um, over the summer. Uh, we're asked to um, note the updates on the corporate risks for the quarter, and they don't seem to have been too many updates so could we unless there are any no we go to the vote on that then please just note that chair that motion has carried uh, thank you very much and continuing with the ian cooper show it's uh, item nine which is the first quarter revenue monitoring report. Ian, to you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so I'll take you briefly through some of the key parts of this report. Uh, if I start on page on table three, on page 49 of the pack, um, on, so page 49 onwards, uh, that summarizes the various variances reporting in this quarter, uh, which are mainly a combination of COVID-19 impacts, mm. um, some carry forward requests, and the one on the um, waste contract inflation, uh, whereby suddenly the inflation rates all shot up after we've done the estimates, and actually inflation rates much higher than we thought it might be. I think a big part of that to blame is the sort of the fuel fuel element of the contract, which is obviously a fair amount to include given the number of miles that those those freighters have to do on a daily basis. Um, in terms of the detail in that table, uh, the COVID-19 impacts are a combination of full year projections and where there's greater uncertainty in that table, just the quarter one impact at this stage. Uh, table five, um, which is further on into the report, um, is a, I think does include the full year forecast for some of the areas where we've only put a quarter one impact in that table. Um, so that's for uh, parking, and also for um, the takings at Hitchin Town Hall in relation to the uh, lettings of the uh, facilities there. Um, and then that feeds into table six in terms of the overall general fund summary from that table five. Um, I think recent performance in terms of looking at the uh, car park since the end of quarter one would imply that, that hopefully that um, forecast and parking is hopefully overly prudent and it will get a lot better. 
Um, certainly, I've heard stories that the hitching car parts are now quite often full, um, which obviously means that the takings are up, more up towards normal levels. Um, so we will do an update on that at quarter two. Um, also, a quarter two, we'll have a much better picture on the leisure recovery. Um, hopefully you'll be aware from budget last year, uh, we set a provision for two million pounds additional costs in relation to the leisure recovery and the cost this year. Uh, we are keeping that under regular review. Um, whilst performance in the first quarter and up to just for the sort of summer holidays was good and good things were going well, uh, there is always a dip um, in number of visits to the Leisure Centre and usage of them over the summer period. Um, so once we're through that dip, we have a much better picture about where it's going for the full year. So again, when we get to quarter two and the monitor then, I've got a much better picture about the overall picture about where we're going. Uh, but at the moment, hopeful, it, it'll, be a, it'll be a good, good outcome there. Uh, paragraph 8.12, which is on page 54, uh, refers to the potential for business rate falling in 22-23. Um, early this week, uh, so after the report was written, it has now been confirmed um, that this will be an option um, for next year. So the Hertfordshire authorities, uh, via Hertfordshire County Council, are in the process of commissioning some advice on whether there should be a pool next year, looking at the risk of that and who should be in it. Uh, the closing date for applications to be a pool is the 8th of October, so really tight. So that was the reason we put forward in this report the request um, for a delegated decision on that, uh, which is sort of in common with previous years when it gets announced at the last minute and given a really tight deadline to respond. Uh, it is likely that being part of a pool will, will be beneficial, uh, but there is also the element about whether North Hertfordshire would be in the option pool for the overall county. Uh, I think that covers the main points I want to draw out from the report, but you appreciate it's a long report, so if there are points, any other points you want to ask questions on or comment on, happy to respond to those accordingly. Thanks, Ian. Uh, yeah, I see that um, a lot of it's down to, it's COVID associated, isn't it? Uh, although judging by the number of cars trying to find parking spaces in Hitchin this weekend, I would hope that car parking fees income will actually be better than we're forecasting. Um, members, over to you. Anybody want to uh, ask a question or speak? Nope. Okay, then we are asked to, uh, the recommendations say that Cabinet note this the report, so I presume we're just recommending to Cabinet that they do recommend the report, um, but we're asked to vote on those recommendations anyway. That Cabinet note the report, proves the changes, notes the changes to the general fund and delegates so as you can see those four points in front of you. So could we please vote on those? Chair, that motion has been carried. Thank you very much. And on to item 10, the first quarter investment strategy. Uh, back to you, Ian. Thank you, Chair. So the investment strategy is the report that covers both capital and treasury uh, in terms of our surplus cash and how we invest it. Uh, there is one change between the version of the report in front of you and the version that has gone to cabinet. Uh, in table three on page 63, we've had an additional item in there uh, which relates to Cumes Community Centre. Um, there was a budget uh, allocated for this year of 25,000 um, to do improvement works to fix the issues they've got there, which is basically involves wastewater going where it shouldn't do, which isn't very nice. Um, the works have been completed in terms of that phase, and there has been some improvements, uh, but as part of those works uh, and a sort of expert drainage person getting involved, uh, some more work's been recommended in terms of being very light to completely fix the issue. Uh, they will cost another forecast, another 25,000, um, so the request that will be going to Cabinet uh, on the basis of this is that it's a significant overspend against the regional budget is whether they're prepared to allocate another £25,000 of budget against that item. Um, I have tried to get reassurances that it will, you know, in all likelihood, fix the problem. Because um, if it does, then that's, I think that's money well spent. Obviously, we don't want to put chucking more money at it if it's not going to solve the problem. So that's what's going to Cabinet on top of what's on the table. 
it does have a knock-on effect on, on a lot of numbers in the report, but I don't think it's a significant overall impact. Uh, but I just wanted to make you, as the committee, aware of that change. Um, so looking at some of the detail in the report, uh, so table four uh, in the report um, does show that we will need to borrow if we fully spend the capital programme, uh, but that does depend on appropriate uh, opportunities in relation to property acquisition and development, uh, both in terms of, I suppose, sort of the more commercial property side, as well as uh, as opportunities in terms of residential properties. And that makes up about eight, 11 million of the total. Um, if those opportunities don't arise, then it's therefore like we won't need to borrow. So that, that's kind of the, the big factor in terms of the uh, need to borrow. And therefore we have not looked into any borrowing at this stage. Um, if, if those opportunities do arise, we'll start to look at um, how and what we will borrow and what terms and those kind of things. Uh, the picture on Treasury is that we have more cash um, than we forecast, and that's because we've still got various um, sources of funding from government that either is due to go out to businesses or to individuals through the various COVID reliefs and COVID support, or whereby we've got grants that are due to be spent that haven't been spent yet. Uh, but unfortunately, the rates that we're earning on surplus cash are, are very low. Um, in terms of a sort of term investment between one month and sort of up to a year, you're looking at a rate of return of 0, 0.0 something percent, which is tiny. Uh, if you push it out to a whole year, you might get 0.1% as a return. Um, and as we go through the year, you'll see that more and more of the old investments are dropping out. Even those are only at 0.4% and 0.3%, but that's still better than what we're getting now. Uh, so as they drop out, the, the, you know, the marginal rate return is going down even more. Um, there wasn't much else in the report that I was going to cover, uh, but as ever, you know, it's got lots of detail in both the report and the two appendices. So again, happy for any questions on, on any of the detail in those reports. Thank you, Ian. Um, we have recommendations that note the forecast expenditure and approve the adjustments. Um, and note the availability of capital. Um, any questions from members to uh, Councillor Hone? Terry. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, very interested in uh, plan borrowings of uh, 5.2 million, 5.25 million pounds. I can't remember the last time we got into that sort of state where we borrowed so much money or looking to borrow so much money um, to fund projects which we don't know too much about at the moment, of course, it says housing. Um, no doubt we've included that in the projection of interest that we'd have to pay, which, based on my calculations, is not unsubstantial. Um, can you confirm that? And how much was included in the, the 2021 uh, uh, revenue budget to cover that 5.2 million should we need to borrow it? Yeah, so, so in, in relation to those uh, capital spend that we hope that we expect to generate revenue, uh, we haven't included either side of the equation. So we haven't included the borrowing costs, but we haven't included any income from those investments. So on that basis, anything we do should be good news in terms of the, we wouldn't do it unless we can get a rate of return above what it would cost to borrow that money. Um, so the borrowing costs are in there, but then neither is the income. Um, so I think that's kind of a fairly prudent decision to take when we actually have no idea what those opportunities might be. But ultimately it would have an impact, won't it? It will have an impact on both sides. Yeah, we will generate some income and we'll have some costs in terms of borrowing. Mm. Uh, and they will, either, they will at least net each other out, but we would only do it if there actually can be more income and it's what it costs us. Yeah, so initially there'll be, of course, be more expenditure on interest and then we anticipate more income from the investment opportunities that we're having. But certainly, um, will they offset each other? It depends on the rates of what the rates are doing, I guess. Yeah, Thank you. It was kind of any sort of lag between the, the, the investment and it generates return. Obviously, if we buy a ready-built property of some sort, that will probably generate some income straight away. If we look to build something, it will take time to generate some income. So in theory, I'm right in saying that as far as what we have in the bank, so to speak, at capital, is not um, the best it's ever been. No, no we, we have over time been, been using up uh, over many, many years yeah. Uh, the set aside receipts we got from the housing stock transfer to settle in 2003. Take yeah. a long time to get through them all, uh, but it's getting to the point now where it's going to flip over uh, and they, we, we are going to be in foreign position. Like many other, other authorities are, 
uh, we are still generating some capital receipts from sale of new land. Um, and I'll come a bit more to that later in, in the report on the uh, balance sheet review and balance sheet insight around what, what those numbers look like. Um, but yes, it, you're correct, Eric, correct Councillor Hone, we have almost run out of those, those receipts in 2003. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we've made them last since 2003. I thought it's pretty good, really. Uh, we've we've made those receipts. Uh, what, what, yeah, I'm just w wondering how much we haven't had in from government over the last 20 years. But there you go. Um, right, uh, we're asked to um, vote on the recommendations that you have before you, unless there are any other points. OK, would you please vote on the recommendations? Chair, yeah, that motion has passed. Thank you. Carry. Thanks. Um, okay, thanks, James. And on to uh, item 11, the medium term financial strategy. Ian again. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so the strategy is attached to Appendix A, which is page 93. Uh, the version here is due two more updates, um, but they're both kind of very minor ones. So, firstly, uh, hopefully, the communications team will very soon be looking at the exact wording of the report and in terms of the strategy, just trying to make it a bit more accessible to, to the public and other people. Um, so I saw a few sort of minor wording changes just to kind of make it a bit more friendly. Um, and then after that, um, so probably after the cabinet meeting and after the way the council meeting was adopted, um, some work on improving the presentation of it. Um, so looking at how we can you know, make it a bit more easier to read and also to ensure that it's consistent with the presentation of council plan as they are sister documents. Uh, but the technical content uh, and the principles um, are correct and, and what we're going to go with. Um, so given the role of this committee, I think it's the right time to bring it to you uh, and ask for your comments on it, uh, given that is your kind of role to look at the, the detail rather than um, what it looks like. Um, so in terms of the actual content, I'll give you a brief run through of um, some of the content. Um, the content is very standard in terms of what it looks like each year, um, but as well as the usual uh, considerations, um, the section starting on page 95 does unfortunately have to continue to consider the impacts of COVID-19, um, because we think they will still be there for next year, uh, and considers the uh, ongoing impact, uh, sort of makes provision for what those amounts could be uh, in both next year and a smaller amount in the year after. Uh, so then moving on from that, we then got um, sort of some sort of principles around some forecasting in there. So some of the key bits in there are we are assuming that uh, in next year, uh, given there's been no news on any changes to funding formula, and given how late in the day it is now, we're assuming there won't be any funding formula for next year, which means a, a rollover, we assume, of what happened this year. Uh, which means no negative RSG, a uh, negative RSG is negative revenue support grant, um, which, was, which is what's been hanging over our heads for a number of years now, um, going back to around about 2016, um, when it was determined that we as a council had too much money and therefore what we were getting in a business rate should be cut by a million pounds and more, a million pound more of our, our business rate income should be taken away from us. It's never been implemented, uh, but our current prudent assumption is that at some point when the new funding formula does come in, um, that we will have an amount equivalent to that taken away from us. Uh, we will continue to hope that doesn't happen, but have to plan on the basis that we think it possibly might. Um, in relation to our funding streams, you'll see some sort of assumptions there around what happened in relation to both council tax and business rates. So on the council tax side, uh, we, can, we are now assuming uh, a small amount of growth in the council tax base. Uh, we took all that growth out for last year's strategy, uh, but hopefully now it's, it's prudent to just estimate a little bit of growth in the council tax base, albeit a much lower increase than what we are forecasting before, uh, and, and far below what we realistically expect in terms of pure housing numbers, uh, if and when the local plan goes ahead and all that, all that house building happens. Um, part of that is to reflect that 
Um, we are still seeing high levels of council tax reduction scheme eligibility. Um, we would hope that as the impact of COVID-19 diminishes across the district and, and start, stops having such an impact on our, on our residents, that more and more people will be able to pay the full value of, of council tax, uh, which will therefore impact on that council tax base numbers. Um, we, we are assuming in the, in the strategy that we will continue to increase council tax uh, by, by the, the highest amount we're allowed to without needing a referendum, um, which at the moment it, it is five pounds on a band D equivalent property. Um, over time, I think by the end of the strategy, it does get to the point where five pounds is less than the uh, than the two percent, which is the alternative measure about what you can increase it by. Um, all that leads to an assumption um, that we will need to make 1.8 million of savings uh, over the five year period. And the phasing of that is detailed in the table on page uh, 100. Um, so you've got that gray line in there, which shows a forecast that next year we need to make savings of 200,000 pounds and the year after an additional £400,000, an additional cumulative £600,000, a cumulative £1 million by 2425, up to cumulative £1.8 million by 2627. Um, and then the bottom of page 100, moving through to page 101, uh, then details uh, how we plan to achieve that. Um, so um, we've got the sort of fundamentals in terms of, we would hope to be able to do the sort of the, the three bullet points at the top, um, sort of moving from page 100 into page 101. So that's being able to deliver existing services at lower cost through transformation, automation, and technology. Uh, we'd hope to, be able to generate additional income, uh, both from our services and also commercial activities. But we are mindful that, unfortunately, the fourth bullet point may have to be a reality. That we have to look at the way we provide our services and, and how we deliver them uh, with stopping doing some things and doing less of other things. Um, I think that has to be kind of on there, it has to be an option. And then the bullet points immediately below that, the next set of bullet points, uh, details the role of the budget challenge process uh, in terms of a bit more detail about how we get there and what we're gonna look at and how we make sure it's delivered. Um, and then you'll notice right at the end of the report, there's a little bit of great touch on capital budgets in future years. Uh, the point of this report is to mainly focus on the revenue side, but as we've sort of discussed in the last, last report, if you are borrowing money, it does have revenue implications. And therefore, we will need to be mindful of that and then make sure that they feed through uh, between the two reports and between the, between the strategies. Um, so I plan on stopping there and letting you ask me any questions you want in terms of detail of the report or of the appendix. Thank you very much, Ian. Um, members, anyone wish to speak to that? I mean, I know local government finance hasn't been a lot of fun for a number of years. I remember coming to those with another hat on to the business ratepayers consultation and there was never any money to do anything. So um, I, I think we make a, a, a great job out of a poor resource. <laughs> no? Okay, then we are asked to uh, recommend a note and comment, which we... Well, we've noted, we've not commented particularly. And then we recommend to Cabinet that they uh, recommend to full council the adoption of the medium term financial strategy. Can you vote, please? Chair, that motion has carried. Thank you. Thanks, James. Uh, right, on to item 12 financial regulations review. Back to you, Ian. Thank you, Chair. I think this is pretty much summarised by the executive summary. Uh, we've done the, we, we do sort of annual reviews of the financial regulations, and usually there's kind of one or two changes, which I have um, authority under the, under the Constitution to make those very minor changes to the financial regs. Uh, this time we've done a more in-depth review. Uh, there is nothing fundamental in terms of what we're changing. Um, and as summarised in, in section one, there are kind of four categories of changes. Um, from some minor changes to processes um, through to just changing grammar, grammar and adding some clarity to some of the points. Um, so in Appendix A, I'm not going to go through in detail, but obviously I'll answer any questions there are on it, uh, are each of the changes we're proposing or making and the reason for those changes. Um, so overall, uh, this is a report that goes directly from here 
um, if you are happy with it, to full council uh, with the recommendation that full council then adopt these changes to financial regulations. Um, so I'll ask you to comment. Um, anything not clear, please ask me. Um, and if it's all okay, I'll go to full council. Thanks very much, Ian. In, in fact, I was going to commend you on making it very clear to us in the appendix as to what was changing and why it was changing. So thank you very much for that. Um, any comments from anyone? No, we're all all right with that. So, oh, yes, sorry, Councillor Compton-Adam. Sorry, thank you, Councillor Hoskins. Um, Ian, it was just a really quick one around section 16. Um, so you added a section about goods receipting and invoices. Did we not have a three-way match before for all invoices coming through? Have I misunderstood what it's suggesting there? So historically, did we just get an invoice in and pay it without having a goods receipt to confirm that? Because that's what it read like to me. Um, we, 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 no, no, we've, 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 we've had a, we had a combination before. So we're moving to goods receipting. Uh, we, we, we're, we're trying to get everything to be goods receipting, which is the reason for the change. Uh, there has been a sort of combination before where sometimes you get an invoice without a purchase order and therefore no goods receipting. This is just kind of confirming that we are going to move to a situation where, as you say, you have a good, you have a, you have a purchase order, you receive the goods, you give the seat, and then you get the invoice and they all match. Um, so it's just confirming that as a process and trying to move away from any situations or minimizing situations where you don't go through that process. There'll still be some occasionally, but, but the, you know, the, the broad principle is that that free way match should happen. Okay, so no, that's helpful. I was just making sure that was sort of the normal status quo because I was a little bit concerned there. Um, and the only other question I had was around uh, approving orders that have been made. There's a section, and I've lost it now, but it states that the system will warn people that they don't have the budget to raise an order or approve an order, but it will not stop them from doing it. Given that we have just been talking about overspend, et cetera, et cetera, is that not something we could change to have a hard stop over a certain value? So finance colleagues within the council can speak to whoever's actually ordering it to make sure they've actually got the budget before we commit to anything. So that does seem like a large risk to me, particularly on large purchase orders. It's a difficult one, uh, to be honest, uh, because we do have situations where you, for, for good reason, we have budget split across various codes, and you'll raise the order against one code rather than across all the different codes it might relate to in the end. Uh, and therefore, you might end up blocking invoices, blocking orders that are completely valid. But I do take your point, and we'll look into that and see if there should be more we can do to kind of mitigate against, against that risk. Um, we do have, re I think, we have really good financial control, many really good budget managers out there. Who do know what their budgets are and don't do things like that. But, but I'll have to look at a bit more detail about whether there's anything more we can do in relation to that. That'd be really helpful. Thanks, Ian. And that was 16.13 was a section just for the minutes. Thanks. Okay. Thanks very much for raising that. And so with that, um, oh, Claire. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask a question about the um, bit in reference to SAFs. Um, I know that SAFs works with councils to look at, you know, individuals, residents that might be committing fraud, but is this more to do with um, people within the council that might be commit committing fraud? Yeah, I think the references here are just to mirror what the powers that the shared internal audit service have. Uh, and actually, you're right. But in 99% of the time, in fact, almost all the time, uh, SAS we're dealing with fraud against the council, not fraud within the council by employees or sort of that, of that nature. But if they were to be doing that, at the moment, the financial regs don't actually allow them to sort of question people and require answers from people, which is obviously an oversight because we would, we would need that power for them if they have ever had to use it. So it's correcting an oversight, albeit they'll probably never ever use it. But if it's needed, we need to have it. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. So um, with uh, Adam's uh, thoughts on uh, invoicing in mind, can we move to recommendation um, that we recommend them to council for adoption, please? Please vote.
Chair, that motion is carried unanimously. Thank you very much. Um, and now we are on to agenda item 13, I think, yes. Uh, financial Management Code and Balance Sheet. Um, Ian, to you for this final one, by the looks, I think. Yep, this is the last, last substantive item on the, on the agenda. Um, the report is in two parts. Um, so the first part is an assessment against the Financial Management Code, uh, which is a brief bit of background. Uh, is a new code that was launched by SIPFA, the Charles Institute of Public Finance and Accountancy, in 2019. Uh, it was partly launched to make sure that all councils had good um, financial management process in place, uh, in, I guess partly in response to the fact there were a couple of high-profile council failures uh, preceding that. Um, and therefore, um, we, is a, uh, we have looked at that code and on a few occasions now gone through it um, and mapped where we are against it um, to make sure we're happy with how we're performing against it. Uh, as you'll see in the report, this has come to this committee before, uh, but um, they have now issued some guidance notes. We've now taken the time to go through those guidance notes and just do a triple check uh, to make sure that we are happy with uh, what the guidance notes say as well as what the code says uh, and how we map against that. Um, so as you will hopefully see in Appendix uh, A, um, that goes through the detail of the code um, and the kind of what each, each element it says, which we're doing and looks at what actions you should be taking in relation to that. And each of those actions is, is marked in there in bold. Uh, and that's something that um, I plan on keeping, look, keeping an eye on and making sure regular reviews to make sure we are doing what, what we say we're doing in, the, in those actions. Um, obviously, when we come to it, have, um, I'll get to this in a minute, have the questions on, on that content. And also you think the actions in there are appropriate. Uh, they have been discussed with both the officer um, leadership team and also uh, political liaison board as the um, joint uh, officer and member uh, leadership team comprising senior officers and, and, and members of cabinet uh, and have been approved by, by both those as being kind of sensible actions to be taking uh, but coming to you in your in your oversight role in relation to um, financial management. Um, in terms of the second part which I'm going to go through in a lot more detail um, that's in relation to the balance sheet side of it. But before I do, is it worth if there's any questions on that first part, uh, Appendix A, uh, taking those now, if there are any? Any comments, members, or questions? I'm not quite sure what's on Appendix A. That's all. Which means Appendix A starts, yeah. Well, in which case, I do have a question. If that's, if that's Appendix A, I can't see it says Appendix A at the top. Perhaps it's me. Um, okay, Councillor Hone, Terry. Thank you. If I may, um, recent, yes, item number C, if I'm still talking the same appendix. The recent SIAS review of finance audit risk made a recommendation about having an independent member. Action required, continue to progress with an independent FARC member. Comments, please. Uh, that is being progressed. I am hoping it, to have all the constitutional stuff in place um, so we can recruit someone for the start of next civic year. Uh, unfortunately, it's taking a long time to get all that kind of stuff sorted. Uh, and then we'll have to go through the interview process to find someone. I'm hoping that for next, next civic year, we'll have someone in place, an independent member. Okay, perhaps if we don't, then you can again report it and we can be aware that uh, that is due to us, so to speak. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Ian. Any other comments? No, nope. I think you can carry on then. Okay. Thank you. So point O in that list, which is on uh, page 161, talks about uh, having a greater understanding of what the council balance sheet, balance sheet shows. And therefore, this um, second appendix, um, which I'm not sure it's labelled properly either, but the lots of arrows and comments starting on page 163, that section starting there, 
is a look at our balance sheet. And I'm going to run through that with you. I'm going to do it as a, as a mini training session for you. Um, but I won't go into a lot of detail, but I will just pick out some of the, the, the main points out of it. Um, so I'll start that uh, with the first page. So 163. Uh, and you'll see in the top left corner of each page is our actual balance sheet. That is from our statement of accounts, our draft statement of accounts uh, for 2020-21, uh, which will be audited in due course by Ernst & Young. Um, so picking out some of the key elements from it, uh, there are bits, bits I stick, skip over, and that's because there are elements of our balance sheet which are frankly not very relevant to most people or anyone. Uh, there are a series of accounting adjustments that don't mean anything at all. Um, so you have things in there like property revaluations, um, unless you're going to sell a property, a revaluation property is, you know, doesn't mean the thing. Uh, equally, pension, um, future liabilities uh, are, are also relevant. So there are things in there that we'll just won't, won't, won't touch on, uh, but the, I'm going to sort of draw out the key points from it. Um, so in terms of long-term property assets, uh, the sort of the blue then valuations of those properties are, are generally relevant. Uh, what is useful is to know the kind of broad scope of property we've got. Uh, and actually, most of our property, given we plan to keep it and not do anything with it and deliver services from it, it, it is, you know, is a risk uh, in terms of we have to maintain that property and have to put the revenue and capital aside potentially in future to maintain that property in its current state. And therefore, we need to sort of know what the quantum is so we know what kind of those risks and, and, and issues might be in the future. Um, I think the sort of the main one to sort of point out from that whole list is, I suppose, plant and equipment. And that is the kind of asset has the shortest life. Uh, the biggest value in there um, is the uh, waste vehicles. And they last about seven years. Um, so, so when we get the new contract uh, for waste, um, we sort of contract renewal point. Um, we will need to look at new vehicles and therefore there'll be a cost associated with that. Um, and you know, we are sending some outside some money from, from, from kind of the lease arrangement as it stands at the moment um, to, to help fund that. But if we are looking at, at greener vehicles, electric vehicles potentially moving forward, that they will come at a cost and therefore we need to be, be, be aware of that. Uh, I suppose on the property side, the one sort of Benefit, I guess, is, is where we've got surplus assets. Um, and they're sort of in two, two sections. You've got the surplus assets in the long-term section, and they are generally land that we've got that we don't need for service use. Um, and they, the surplus ones are the ones that will sell in more than one year. And the assets held for sale on the next page, they're talked about on page 164. They are the ones that will sell in less than a year, we think, is our forecast. And that is property we've got. Uh, land that we plan on selling, which will generate capital receipts uh, and, and forecasts of that are built into the investment strategy. And that does help to fund our capital program, uh, albeit that we do need to use borrowing as well with the forecast in the, in the, in the not too distant future. Uh, also on that same page 163, just to highlight the investment property section, uh, they do generate income for us. Uh, so that's the property that our estate team manage. Um, and I guess the, the risk of that has been highlighted over the past year and a half in relation to COVID-19, you know, that, that income is not guaranteed. Um, and therefore, um, we do need to consider that as, as, as a risk. Um, if the property market is not going so well, then we may not necessarily get paid either at all or on time. So we just need to keep an eye on that and make sure we do hope to get paid in the end. Um, so then moving on to the next page, 164, the amount I wanted to highlight here was in relation to short-term debtors. Uh, and this is mainly is owed to us, uh, that, that we expect to receive within the next year. Um, I'm not too concerned about the um, top two sections of the bullet points there in terms of central government and local government. Uh, I expect that to be paid um, in, in due course as and when it becomes due. Uh, sometimes it requires a bit of chasing, but you, we pretty much always get the money we're owed in those respects. Um, I guess the, issue, the issues are going to be in relation to the bottom three bullet points, which is uh, business rates we're owed, council tax we're owed, housing benefit overpayments, and just the general amounts that are owed to us by individuals and businesses. Uh, and and those, that, those amounts have shot up uh, as an impact of, of COVID-19. 
and therefore we are setting aside uh, what's known as a bad, an increased bad debt provision, which is an allowance we make uh, where, where debt is old, but the, 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 the possibility we won't get it all back. Uh, if we get the bad debt provision uh, calculation correct, these numbers are all fine, uh, but in all likelihood we'll either get it too high in terms of actually get in more money than we're forecasting or too low, uh, whereby we actually need there's a more cost to be hit uh, at the point we don't get that money in. Um, moving on to that same page and the box at the bottom there, we just talk about short term non property investments and cash and cash equivalents. That is essentially our treasury money. So that's the cash we've got that we need to invest in various places. Uh, the differences in categorizations being how long it's invested for. Uh, so money invested for more than a year moves into long term investments. Uh, between three months and a year uh, sits in uh, um, sort of the non property investments um, short term. And if it's uh, less than three months, it's treated as cash and cash equivalents. Um, so there's all sorts of categories, but essentially the same thing. It's that money we've got, uh, and I'll come on to what kind of makes up that, that total in a bit uh, that, we, that we invest, and you'll see that more detailed investment strategy on that. Uh, moving on to page 165, there's a section there of borrowing. Uh, we do have some historic borrowing. This is borrowing we took out Prior to 2003, when we got the um, income from the housing stock transfer, uh, and it was long term borrowing at that point, um, and it's still being repaid uh, because the term of the debt is either not up or it's on a very, very slow repayment. Um, it's not worth repaying that debt early, uh, even though we've got the cash to do so, um, because of the, pre the, the premium we have to pay to repay it early, uh, because a lot of these um, debts are at quite high interest rate, so therefore to pay it early, you've got to eventually pay the interest up front uh, the, the, the uh, PWRB will get eventually over the longer term. Um, so there's a section there on that borrowing. Um, and obviously if we do take out new borrowing in the future, that, that will feature in that total on the balance sheet, will be money we, we, we've received uh, and need to pay back uh, over a period of time. Um, and then moving on to the bottom of page 166, there's a section there on provisions. Uh, and this is in relation to the main bit of that, it's in relation to NNDR appeals, so uh, business rate appeals. Uh, so quite a lot of detail there about the fact that um, businesses can and do appeal their valuation um, in terms of what they have to pay on business rates. Uh, and when that happens, that goes to the valuation office agency, uh, who unfortunately have a huge backlog. Uh, they had a backlog of workload even before COVID-19, and it just got worse and worse. Um, they are still looking at, I believe, the 2015 list of um, appeals, uh, let alone the, the later lists um, of, of various valuations that have taken place. Um, so that means we when they do determine whether the business has a case to answer in terms of whether they should get a reduced bill, um, then we, we have to pretty much fund our share of, of that, that hit in terms of the lost, the, the lost income. They're not going to pay us. And therefore, we set a provision aside um, to try and estimate what that impact might be and account for that rather than taking the full hit uh, when and if it happens. Um, it, it's a be honest, a ridiculous situation whereby we are tying up money um, that just sits there for years and years and years, and it's not doing any good for anyone. Um, so it, it is not a great system, um, but it's it, it's something that we just have to live with, unfortunately. Um, so then moving on to page 167, I will just briefly touch on pensions, even though it's kind of essentially a relevant number. Uh, we do have a big number in there for, for the liability related to our pension scheme. Um, we pay a percentage of employee costs. Um, basically, what we pay to our pay, pay a salaries, we pay a percentage of that as a contribution to the pension scheme um, for um, pension benefits that are accruing at the moment. Uh, we also pay a lump sum to try and cover off the historic uh, pension liabilities. 
Uh, so people who have worked in the past and accrued uh, pension, uh, but it was underestimated in the past how much that would cost, um, the combination of them living longer uh, and, and costs of living changes and therefore pension rates changing. Uh, so therefore that's that, that lump sum to try to catch up on that. So that's what we actually pay. And that's the amount that we reflect in our income and expenditure accounts. Uh, but we are also required to show on a balance sheet the current position, uh, which is that huge £46 million pound number. Um, but that does get reversed back out of our accounts uh, when we report on it, because uh, what we're trying to do is we're trying to stabilise the, the funding of that pension liability over the long term uh, to get there uh, eventually. Um, so there's no real issue in terms of that ever being called upon as being a, a cost that needs to be funded, needs to be funded now. And the last bit, um, I'll stop talking soon, is just to highlight the usable and unusable reserves section. It's the bottom of page 167. Uh, unusable reserves are all the adjustments that I've talked about that are just accounting entries that aren't real money. So when we uh, reflect the cost of pensions at the top half of the balance sheet, it then gets reversed out to the bottom half of the balance sheet. The two numbers just offset each other. Uh, and it's not real money, it doesn't do anything any good for anyone. It's just, just accounting um, keeps um, my team in a job and preserves even a job, but doesn't really uh, better affect the council taxpayer. Uh, reserves are of use to the council and um, information for the council taxpayer. Um, and that list uh, on that box, bottom of page 167, um, is the various amounts of money we've got. And this broadly, um, give or take some cash flow differences, it is the money we've got for long-term investments. Um, so it's the general fund reserve balance, uh, it's our earmark reserves that we set aside, uh, and then it's our capital receipts that we've got available. So that's money we can spend. Um, in all cases, same money we can spend once. Um, so we've got to, you know, we've got to be prudent, and we've got to set a budget that, that considers the use of reserves if we want to use them. Um, but, but it is money that, that the council has that it can spend on things, albeit for earmark reserves, they are set aside for a specific purpose that the full council has determined is a, a good purpose which we spent on, and therefore that, that, that has to maintain the case that that's what they're spent on. I just want to kind of give you a, a brief summary of all the content that was in that section of the report, uh, but obviously there's a lot more in there. Uh, if you want to come back with any questions or comments on what I've said, then I'm happy to try and answer them. Thanks, Ian, very much for that uh, overview. Uh, members, Councillor Home, Terry. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ian, as well. And great you've done this because uh, some don't understand a balance sheet when they see it, and it's patently obvious that they don't understand the difference between assets and liabilities and revenue and capital. Uh, where in here is the uh, money that we have put out to uh, Stevenage Leisure in terms of, I would have thought it'd been somewhere in uh, a current asset. Um, Short-term debtors, I would have thought it's in. The four million pounds that we put in there. Whereabouts is it or shown on that balance sheet uh, summary? So, we, so in terms of assuming that you've got, uh, we've got a loan with them um, in relation to the, the equipment purchase. Uh, but from the number you've just said, you say four million. Well, I thought we did significant investment because they were struggling short of cash. So, so in terms of, in terms of um, providing money to them to run the service, uh, that, that will go through the expenditure and it will be you know, a, a loss of cash and the cost of service. Uh, it's not money that we are expecting to get back. Um, so if it, you know, the, the, it's not a debtor in terms of money they're going to pay back to us. Um, obviously, we hope they'll get back to normal and start to pay us money again in terms of what they do for duty pay us. But the amount we're providing at the moment is, is funding to keep them going. It, it, it's not money we expect to get back at any point in the future. But they are not showing it as a liability in their books, then. Well, so they would just show it as income. Um, they would show it as income they've got towards supporting the running of the leisure centres. So, so just make, would... make clear in my own mind, if I can, please. Therefore, the money which we gave to Stevenage Leisure, we do not expect to get any of that money back. We the cannot guarantee. Been, the money we've been providing to them to basically on, on an open book basis to support their losses. Uh, we are we are paying to them to, to keep the leisure centres open. It, it is money that we um, 
we, we are funding to to keep those legislators open. Uh, it is not money that yeah, sorry, sorry, the, the, the reason yeah, well, the reason why we're doing it is is immaterial. It is the fact that we made a significant investment there. We took a lot of money and paid it over to Stephen's leisure after lots of discussions and lots of decision making processes. And in our books, we are showing it as spent. We are showing it as spent. Yes, it was. It was. It was not four million. That's, okay. Uh, and thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. That's all I need to know. It's not. We're not showing it. Therefore, we do not expect to get it back. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else wish to? Uh speak okay then we are asked that to note this report comment on the actions arising from the review of the financial management code um okay we'll proceed to a vote then chair that motion is carried unanimously Thank you, James. Right. And thanks, Ian, for all the, the work on that as well. Um, the final item on the agenda says that I'm going to lead a discussion regarding possible agenda items for future meetings. As we do this at every meeting, and there, there re really doesn't, not a great deal comes out about this. May I just ask that, oh, Morgan, Councillor Derbyshire, thank you. I have got something I want to bring up. I brought it up over you in Scrooge as well last night. Okay. Um, on the work programme for ONS for the 14th of December meeting, there's an item called uh, corporate update, uh, sorry, commercial update. Now, given that commercialization is both a, is a corporate risk to this council, surely it would be better off coming to FAR than ONS. I think that's something we could have more of an input on, especially with you, Chairman, being the former portfolio holder for commercialization too okay thank you for that i mean i'm happy for that to come to us i don't know whether that would be a duplication of effort though i'm looking to other members to ian albert i think i mean i guess i mean, morgan moore makes an interesting point and um but i mean what i would say is that there was a discussion by the former chair far with the current chair of overview and scrutiny and the agreement was and and was requested by the chair of overview and scrutiny councillor levitt that actually would be dealt with there and that was that was the discussion now you know uh, but i mean i think i know mr cooper perhaps come in here because i know he expressed a view at one of these meetings about how the best way to handle handle that is and perhaps if we if ian could comment on um on on councillor darvish's uh, point yeah, absolutely. Um, Ian Cooper, can you express a view? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. There, there are various things that get raised here that some are clearly probably not the this committee. Um, and aren't and are a review and scrutiny. I guess I, I agree that this is one of those ones that could be either way. They could sit in scrutiny, or it could sit here. Uh, you you are not a scrutiny committee, um, but you obviously do have a role in terms of. Of finance and risk and yeah, you know, all the things that kind of would feed into that, that sort of that sort of arena. Um, so I, I guess I'm, what I'm saying is it is down to an agreement between uh, yourself, Council Hoskins, and, and Council Levitt as to where you wanted to sit. Uh, I think it is correct it should sit in one or the other, but not both. Yeah, I quite agree. We want them, want them to do both. Uh, maybe then I shall have a conversation with Councillor David Levitt and see 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 what he would like to do with this. Are you, are you overviewing scrutiny yourself? Only a sub. Oh, only a sub. So I didn't know whether you had a preference yourself. Okay. Well, then I'm sure you'll be talking to your colleague as well. All right. Uh, but I'll send him an email. And, and it may be that that's something that then comes to us rather than overviewing scrutiny. They might, might care to have a rest from it. I don't know. Although they've been... Although, well, they've been very keen in the past to have um, commercial commercialization as a uh, an agenda item, um, a fuller fuller report. But uh, yes, I mean, we could invite members. Last year, of course, we got the stuff very late, and reports did come to to over and scrutiny. Yeah, commercialization. Yeah, it did indeed. I'm, I'm sure I was there well, presenting. I was 
So, all right, well, I'll have a word with uh, Councillor Levitt and uh, we'll see, um, you know, it's almost a case for combining the committees, isn't there? So we just all get it as, as one hit. All right, well, we'll take that on board. Thank you for raising it. Uh, right, well, if there's nothing else, I'm just going to say that the next uh, meeting here is the 15th of December, uh, where we may well be talking about commercialisation, who knows? Um, but thank you all very much. Thank you to the officers. Thank you, Mel. Thank you, James. Thank you, Ian. Um, and I'll see you again soon. Thank you.